Uh, Matthew McConaughey, Academy Award winning actor, is now joining us live. Uh, and it's called Green Lights, by the way. So I will tell you right now, of all the things I'm jealous of, oh, it's not the Academy Award and all that stuff. It's that you had the discipline to write a journal, and it's not a typical journal. It's not sad, um, although there's moments uh, so far of what I've seen. It, you talk about happiness. So, And it's not an advice book. This is not what it is. Give people a sense of what this memoir is about because it took a lot of discipline, and I love the way you attacked it to write about it. Well, it's a lot about attack. It's about approach, really. Um, to life, my personal ap approach approaches that I think everybody can understand in their own lives. You know, green lights. We love green lights in life. They say yes. They're they're freedom. They affirm our way. They say go, out of boy, more, please, continue. We don't like yellow and red lights in life. They slow us down or make us stop. And though we don't like red and yellow lights, I've found that a lot of my red and yellow lights in life, those hardships and crises, actually gave me what I needed or later on revealed their green light assets of lessons I learned from those hard times. So, uh, you know, we can, we can engineer our own green lights in life by choices we make today through responsibility and accountability and delayed gratification. Also, sometimes green lights just land in our lap with good fortune. So what do we do with them when they do? And then other times, it's just about perspective. I can look at a situation differently than you. I may see it as a red light. You may see it as a green light. It's how do we see it? Sometimes, a red light crisis doesn't exist if we just don't even give the damn thing credit. So eventually in the rearview mirror, I do believe that all red and yellow lights do turn green. It's an approach book. You know, it's interesting because in Hollywood, um, you are rare. You are not cynical. Um, mm -hmm. um, you don't lean all the way left. You're kind of relatable. Uh, you love your sports. Your dad was drafted by the Packers. You're kind of a regular guy. In fact, I had years ago, I had a friend that got on a, a, a Delta flight with you flying to da You were flying to Austin. He goes, you won't believe who was on my flight tonight. I said, who? He sat next to me, a Matthew McConaughey. And I said, really? He said, oh, he's a talkative, nice guy. He didn't try to hide. It was a late night flight. Right. And that, by the way, and he spoke very highly of you. Um, and it, it is interesting. You mentioned recently that you, you know, you feel sometimes you get pushback and, and I, it's funny because you've really embraced who you are, your sports, your love for Texas. And that's sometimes you feel like an outsider, but yet you're very much an insider. And as I'm, sure. as I'm kind of rambling here, you, you, have you ever sensed that a little bit, you're in the club, but kind of out of the club. Yeah, maybe somewhat. But you know what? Every time I feel like I'm out of the club, I got to be honest with you, Colin, every time I feel like maybe I'm a little bit out of the club, when I go back there, that community and my peers embrace me wholeheartedly. I mean, the one great thing about Hollywood is that you can go out there and be whoever you want to be. The really tough thing about Hollywood is you can go out there and be whoever the hell you want to be. <laughs> and too many options can make tyrants of anybody. Um, but that, that, that whole industry has overall been, been great to me. Um, and you know, I have a lot of good friends out there. I've met some of the most creative and uh, extraordinary people in my life out there. Now that comes with, you know, some people that have extremely views on to one side or the other that do not agree. I think what I said the other day that you were alluding to when I've talked about my faith, um, you know, uh, I've seen people, everyone's just out there. You're, you're, there's a game to play. There's a game in Hollywood. Do we do our business in the Hollywood game? I've tried to do my business in the Hollywood game. I've also tried to play my own game in the business of Hollywood. But overall, that industry has been very kind and embracing of me, even though, you know, uh, I, I know not everyone agrees uh, with some of the things that I, I believe in. Um, I've done a pretty, I've, I've kept a pretty doggone good relationship with them and they have with me. Yeah. You know, um, we were talking about this, the movies you've done. I loved Contact with Jodie Foster. Loved yeah. it. Oh, God, I loved it. And um, I have seen a UFO, although I still don't believe in them, but I saw one. Not going to get into it. You know, whatever. What? <laughs> Another uh, show? Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but I, 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 you know, Grayland, Washington, I've talked about it ad nauseum. Okay, Wedding Planner, Lincoln Lawyer. You love Lincoln Lawyer, by the way. Dallas Buyers Club, Wolf of Wall Street, Interstellar, which is my daughter's favorite movie. But here's what's interesting. So it's very easy now as an actor to do Netflix and Amazon Prime. It's very easy now because yeah. it's lucrative and it's very good. But you had just won the Academy Award six, seven years ago. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to go do True Detective. It wasn't, yes. as, it wasn't as fashionable then. It was like, whoa, 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 whoa. 
Movie stars don't do that. No, 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 no. That's what you do. Did your agent? They don't go to the small screen. That's right. right. And I thought, did your agent go, hey, Matthew, I want you to take the weekend off, go fly fishing, come back, think about it. Because people seven years ago, Matthew, they were not doing that. No, they, they, they weren't. You bring up a really good point. So at that time, look, I was, I, was, I was rolling. I was doing creative work back to back to back, and I was ferocious about it. Um, and I was consistent. I was choosing character and story. F the bucks. I don't care. I'm going for the experience. I want to choose a role that's going to make me sweat in my boots in a story that I'm like, can't wait to turn the page. And that's what Rustin Cole and True Detective offered. So I remember considering exactly what you said. Now, wait a minute. No one's, you know, I love the script. My agent loved the script. But we said, this is moving to the small screen. Um, and you, you're you succeeding on the big screen at the highest level. That's not what actors do. You're exactly right. But I remember saying, well, the story's there. The character's there. Um, I don't give a damn what screen it's on. And my agent, we, we, we talked about it for about eight seconds. So there was no weekend of fly fishing. I needed no reset. He agreed. I agreed. We plowed forward. And, you know, that show that we did that Nick Pizzolatto created, Carrie Fukunaga directed, myself and Woody did. It is part, it was part of the beginning of the avalanche of so many actors now going to the small screen right. and how you actually find your best dramas, arguably, on the small screen in limited series now. Uh, the other thing that's fascinating, Matthew McConaughey is joining us, is Dallas Buyers Club is is a remarkable performance. It's an absolutely incredible movie. I and mean, it's one of those where you're watching it and you're like, oh, he's going to win the Oscar for this. But it's funny. I've seen De Niro put on weight. I've seen uh, Christian Bale put on weight. And you're a guy that takes care of your body and your mind, your soul. That's who you are. Okay. Yep. And then I, you made a decision. Yeah, I'm going to lose like 60 pounds and be totally unhealthy. And I thought to myself, you know, everybody just thinks, oh, it's a role, you do it. But you're not your typical actor. And I remember watching that thinking, oh, that's going to take him two years to get back to where he was. You can't just eat cheeseburgers and put 50 pounds on. That's totally unhealthy. No. So so when you made that decision, that was not just an emotional decision. It was a physical decision you made. Did you have some, before you made it, did you sit down and think, Man, this is going to take three years of my life. I'm going to have to change three years of my life to do this movie. No, all I initially thought was, hey, how can I lose all of this weight in the most healthy fashion? Meaning, instead of trying to do it in six weeks, I gave myself five months. And I got on a diet where I was losing 2.5 pounds a week like clockwork. Forget the exercise. 2.5 pounds a week like clockwork. Got down to 134. Oh, Lord. Um, now, it was only after that that I considered the way back. And I remember hearing stories and talking to a couple of doctors saying, you can't just go out and start eating your cheeseburgers and rush back <laughs> because you will grow you, you will you will grow back and put on the weight in a more of a deformed way. You have to really walk the dog here. So it did take. Now, mind you, I came out of that I, true detective. I hung at about 165, which was a great sort of younger sort of light fighting weight for me. And I felt really good. Then I slowly moved up uh, to the 175 to 180. And then after that, I, just as I got back to my fighting weight, which is 188, I went and did this film called gold where I got up to 221, <laughs> <laughs> which was a hell of a lot more fun than losing all the weight. I tell you, um, but maybe that's the one I haven't quite recovered from. Cause I got these little things back here on the back, right and the back left to me that kind of can hold a little water if I'm leaning back a little bit, you know? Yeah, no, I, I get it. It's, it's much easier to bang out cheeseburgers and milkshakes. That That's the easy stuff, right? That's oh, yeah. Hanging out with your kids, doing that stuff. Uh, Matthew McConaughey is joining us. So it, you have an interesting saying, and you have said, years ago I thought about writing a screenplay, and I read a book called Save the Cat by Blake Snyder. And he says, name the film before you start writing it. Because you, everybody that writes a film has a great open and a great close. But those story arcs in the middle, you're going to get lost. So go back to what it, the name of it is. You have an idea. You say, I want to see the movie poster. Yes. So explain your thinking on that. Here we go. And it's a lot of the theme through this book. Okay. I, I have, you know, sometimes, and I've been decent at it at times in my life, you go off the cliff and you figure out how to fly on the way down. Not me. I like to be, I call it conservative, early liberal late. And those are not political terms. What I mean by what are the rules? Where are we going? 
what's our direction? Let's pick our general direction we're going. Let's let's write the headline first, then write our story to get to it. Before a film, I'll sit down with the producers and directors and go, what's the poster look like? Well, if the if I'm the lead and it's a silhouette of my face taking up the whole poster, I'm like, oh, that's this is going to be like a really character driven. The director's going to he wants a character driven story here. Well, if it's a big wide shot and there's me and, a, and an army of silhouettes coming up over the mountain, well, this is going to be more of an epic uh, story driven picture. But what is that poster? Just to give us a little bit of a north star to head to. Now, you write that headline. Uh, you, you put that goal in front of you in life and you, and, you, and you say, this is where I see myself. Then you write the story to get there. Then you make the movie to get there. The poster changes. The headline changes. But it's usually similar in the similar vernacular to what you were aiming at. And, I, and I, that's what I mean by I want to see the poster first. Um, I want to write the headline first sometimes and then write the story to get to the headline. Um, and it gives me a, just a, 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 a magic marker out there, a North Star, where we can all agree this is the album we're making. Meaning, like, if you and I go to play music, well, we need to at least say, are we making a rock album here, jazz album, or country album? You know what I mean? Let's have an idea. Yeah. Matthew McConaughey, uh, the memoir is called Green Lights. I just started a couple of nights ago. Many of you may not know. You know of his work, obviously. I just named many of the great movies. Uh, his dad, Jim McConaughey, was drafted by the Green Bay Packers in the 1953 NFL draft. And we, I think both of you, um, you have an appreciation for soccer, which I do. I tried to buy into an MLS team 10 years ago, and I couldn't afford it. You have bought into the Austin team, which is fantastic. I, again, there's another thing I'm jealous of. You kept a journal and you bought a soccer team. Uh, Austin FC, which, by the way, I think the MLS is a growing, fledgling league. I know I know owners in it. It's a fantastic – I think they do a tremendous sport, a uh, tremendous job. But I want to ask you, you have athletics in your family. And um, w- when you take on roles, you can clearly be physical. Has sports – I'm sure it's helped you in your career. But is is thinking like an actor and an athlete, has it ever hindered you? Have you ever thought to yourself, I wish I wasn't such a jock. I wasn't such an athlete. No. I've tried to play, you know, use different parts of my athletic ability. I'll say this. I, I think about athletics all the time in the work that I do. Meaning, preparation. I will out prepare people. I will out prepare my competition and have many times. Um, that's where the work comes in. You know this. You did your work before this show. You're not working right now. We're playing. When you're live, when you're in the game, you can play only if you've done the work. We so you learn the heady stuff is 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 early. It's like if a team gets a new defensive coordinator. And they're probably not going to be that that good if the defense is that complicated the next year because they're thinking about it on the field. And if you got to think about it, you're a half a step slow and that receiver gets by you, touchdown. Right. I don't want to be thinking on the day. I want to be working through my instincts. So I do all my work pregame so I can show up and say, I've got four versions of the truth in this scene. I can call an audible on the go. Don't even yell, cut, we're live, let's go, throw at me, whatever you want. I'm in the game. I read the context. I know the time on the clock. I know what scene I'm in. I know where I am in this story. I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. Give me whatever you got. Let's play. Press record. You are currently the, uh, and will be, the Minister of Culture for the Longhorns Basketball and Entertainment Facility. You're a huge Longhorn fan. I saw you on the sidelines years ago. Didn't want to bother you. USC, Texas, which remains the greatest football game I have ever seen live in my life. Me too. Best game I've ever seen. Um, Best, one of the best dramatic events ever on planet Earth. Hollywood could not have written that script. So I went to that game, and I said, "Give me, a, I want a ticket. I don't want to sit in the press box. So I said, I want a ticket to the game. And I'm kind of a USC honk out here, but I always like Texas. I was right in the middle of Texas fans. And I've said this before on the air. It was the coolest group of people. They, they, knew, they knew they were at Ollie Frazier. Everybody sitting at that game yes. knew, okay, this is last. I've never been to a game where everybody, Texas is like, oh, you're the last team we wanted to play. And the USC behind me is like, I don't want to face Vince Young. This is no good. <laughs> And yeah. t- so go back. So you were a Texas fan before that, but it is. Can Texas get back there? What? Why can't Texas get back? Why are they not there yet? Why are we not there yet? This is a great question. We could do a whole show on this. Um, look, it's many different components. I mean, look, everyone goes through cycles, and we're going through a cycle of rebuilding right now. Um, you know, 
what Tom's come in and a lot of what he has done that we need to continue to do is this alignment of what we expect. Um, and, and look, you come to Texas, you know what's expected. It's you compete for championships. That's the excellence. That's the bar. Um, you are handed the keys to the Ferrari. Here you go. Drive it. And the players and coaches need to understand that. When you get there, that's the expectation. Now, you're going to win a championship every year? Hell no, you're not. Um, a lot of things go into a season. Balls have to bounce your way, et cetera. Um, what do we got to get back? I think, I think this. I think we have to, and, uh, and this is not just a particular problem in Texas, but I do think it is particular in Texas. We got to quit playing in the third person. We have so much media on us. We look at our proverbial jumbotron because with social media today of who do we, who are we? What do we think we are? What's expected? Oh, we won. What's the pressure when we lose? No, forget it. We need to throw all that out and say, F all of that. Put it down. We got, let's put our head down, do the work, stick to the process, look up and, 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 and be objective about what we're doing when the season's over. And if we put our head down in the process and quit, quit thinking about, Hey, how are we perceived? Um, I think we get more wins. I think we're back to that place. Now that you have to have the right people in place to do that. I understand that, but we, 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 we have the personnel. We can get the personnel. We have the players and we can get the players. Um, I think in Texas, part of it is we need to understand, Hey, you are under the microscope here more than any else, anywhere else in the nation. Now, do we look at that and go, Oh geez. Or do we go exactly? That's why I'm here. Now let's go. You press record world. Watch us go. We'll look up when the season's over. And I bet you we got a whole lot more W's. By the way, of all the stuff you've done, green lights, you write a memoir and it's very personal because it's your journal. Was there any point, um, you know, because this is why I'm jealous of you. Because I cry a lot. Kids, you know, just stuff. I'm a dad. Like, did it take you back to places? Sometimes I look at my phone because I want to cry. I want to go look at my kids when they were five. Did it, yeah, take, yeah. did it take you back to places and you were like, oh, my God, I totally forgot. Him. And it took you to these wonderfully emotional places. You know, I, I tell a lot of uh, my dad's essential character in this. And, you know, the book is actually to it's in the, in the beginning. It says this book is, is to the only thing I ever knew I wanted to be and family. And the only thing I ever knew I wanted to be was a father. And a lot of it's based on because of who my dad was to me. You know, my father moved on in 93 and I've done a decent job of keeping his spirit alive in me and continuing conversations with him um, through my life uh, and trying to share things with him spiritually. Um, but I, I, I went back and, and, and retold some of the early stories and looked at the diaries of things I was writing as, as a kid when he was still alive and some times we had. And so going in and remembering some of the details of the way he loved me, the way he loved my mother, the way he loved our family, the values that he tried instilled in us, the way where sometimes where I maybe thought it was unfair, but in retrospect, looked at and go, oh, no, he was really trying. You go back, you know, and, and, and we lose a loved one, our father, and you see that there's some there's a gap between the message and the messenger. Right. And you go, but. And I remember being angry about that gap and going, wait a minute, you didn't really do that, but that's what you taught me. And then I noticed through the diaries that, oh, then I forgave him for that. And then I also said, well, just because maybe he didn't, the messenger didn't act out on the messages he was giving you, Matthew, doesn't mean that the message wasn't good. So you can still double down that. He wanted you to be a little bit better, a little more evolved, a little, a little bit better of a man, and maybe even a better father. So when I went back in those places, I shed quite a few tears seeing uh, um, my dad, how he loved me, my brothers, our family, and his wife, my mother, um, and saw how it was hard sometimes and saw where maybe he didn't live up to what he was teaching, but he damn sure meant it. And uh, I appreciate it in a, diff- in a different way when I went back and looked at it. By the way, I have to ask you about this because my daughter, Olivia, watched Interstellar about a month ago, and she told me it's the best movie she's ever seen. And I said, Olivia, it's very complicated. And during the break yes. before I had you on, <laughs> I told you. And what did you say about how complicated it was? 
I said, uh, here, I'm going to give you my number. Olivia, call me so you can explain it to me. <laughs> <laughs> it is a very complex movie. She literally talked to me. She called me four times about it. She said, Dad, you just can't believe this thing. It's so great. And I'm like, okay, I'll get to it. I've watched like seven of his movies. Just give me time on Interstellar. Matthew, it's been an absolute pleasure. The memoir is called Green Lights. I hope to see you at a Texas football game because I love the program. I love what it stands for, and I'm really rooting for Tom Herman. You're a busy, busy man. Put that book up one more time. Um, Matthew, thank you so much for coming on our show today. Colin, thank you. Look forward to seeing you next time in person. Hook them this Saturday. All Let's long, go get them. All Longhorn games are big games. Great stuff. Thanks, man. Oh, no. Good stuff. That was fun. Tremendous. I'm going to get the book now. Hi, everybody. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show. Also, be sure to check out more of the best clips from The Herd or go watch a few segments from other shows on FS1.